very happy to be here with uh, another Clear Mountain Monastery interview. And today we're here with the Venerable Dr. Panyavati. And Dr. Panyavati has a, a very interesting uh, biography, but we've decided to let you all do the, the research about that. So you can look up, um, you can look on her website, the Hartwood Institute, um, Hartwood Monastery in Henderson, North Carolina to find out more and we'll just jump straight into the uh, the interview. So Venerable Panivati, thank you so much for agreeing thank to- you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Um, so in myself, having read your biography, I'd be curious if you'd be able to say uh, what kind of brought you from, it sounds like you were an evangelical minister, a preacher, and coming from that into first the Mahayana faith and then into Theravada. Could you speak about both of those transitions? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, um, you know, one, uh, as a pastor, what I noticed is that we were always groveling at the altar needing help. You know, I'm always singing a song. I'm looking for a miracle. I'm, you know, I'm believing the impossible. And i tell you the truth, uh, much like a, a mother takes care of her child, uh, great faith has its uh, process and it's working in your life. And so at that level, I received a lot of support from, uh, if I were Buddhist, then I would call them the Buddha, then the Bodhisattvas in the 10 directions. But now I just call them the heavenly beings, you know, uh, as, a, as a Christian, I received a, a lot of support. But I'm like, wait a minute. You know, why are we still groveling at the altar? When do we come up to the fullness of the measure of the statue of Jesus? Which was why I got into it to begin with. And it seemed like that was not happening. And that was the question that I posed within my heart and within my mind. I wanted an answer to that. When do we, um, uh, when will we become like him? You know, the very image of him, the things that he did, we would do in greater and greater things than this. And I did not see the example in the Christian community. And so I, uh, that was my great wish. And through a series of circumstances, I, um, I, I left. And people would ask me, when did you leave Christianity in the beginning? I said, I didn't leave. I just kept going. So by whatever name you want to call it, I find myself further down the road. And I've learned as I have grown up in spiritual things, how it's time to put away some things and take up other things. You know, I felt like, uh, and so that's how I ultimately encountered the Buddha Dharma. Uh, I, first I went to Unity, I think Unity, then uh, UU, I think Christian Science, then, you know, each time stepping away a little further, a little further until I was just out there, you know, and then I was into, um, uh, uh, shamanism, and then, you know, and I had been a charismatic Christian. First, I was Baptist, and, and then, uh, I, and they were so given to hospitality, hospitality, and so I learned hospitality. You know, then I became charismatic Christian, and I learned about certain things. And then, uh, then I found myself just catapulted out of Christianity, but just a step out. And then I found myself way out, uh, and then I encountered Taoism, and then finally, my Taoist master, uh, when I went to see to China to see my Taoist master's master, uh, he said to me, and he was the uh, 16th patriot of the Longman Tao sect of complete enlightenment. Now we're talking about something way different. And he turned to me and he said, Buddhism is for you. I said, no, mm -mm. I looked at that before because I had someone had given me a book on uh, dependent origination and there was the wheel of life and this monster with teeth, you know, and I put up the sign of the cross and I wouldn't even open the book. And, uh, and so it took me, you know, like all of these years to come back around. I think it was something like uh, 18 years, you know, to come back around to dependent origination. So my uh, Taoist master says, Buddhism is for you. I said, no, uh, I, I'm not interested in that. He said, no, it is. And he took me to a, um, a, a nunnery in China. And he asked uh, some of the nuns there to go ahead and give me uh, novice ordination. He said, and when, when you get back to America, you find a, a Theravada, 
uh, I mean a Mahayana temple, and you go there. And uh, so when I came back, I looked for one, but nobody spoke English at any of them. So I went into a Tibetan one instead, a Vajrayana one instead. And one day uh, I was studying. Um, this uh, monk came down the. Uh, he just came down the street, and he was in like a. It looked like a flaming red robe, not like uh, the wine colored ones that that we wear, but this one was like flaming red and he went into his bag and looked like he was moving in slow motion that's just the way my mind recalls it and he whips out in slow motion though this uh book and he hands it to me and it's the majima nikaya right <laughs> now now i'm used to as a charismatic christian i'm used to all kinds of, of experiences right but this book as I began to read, it did something different to me. It grounded me in a certain way. It rooted me. Some people need to be lifted up and some need to be tamped down. So I needed that kind of grounding. And uh, and so I went from, uh, I went back. I would better say, you went backwards. I didn't go backwards. I went where I needed to go, you know, and I went to the Theravada. Now, of course, you know, I'm Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana, like whatever, I don't care what kind of yana you put on it, you know, but I'm interested in the true Buddha Dhamma that which takes up the Buddhic mind and brings us to the fullness of fruition. That's what I'm at, by whatever name you call it. If you look at the uh, Bahia uh, Sutta and the uh, Odana, you will see where uh, Bahia wasn't even a disciple of the Buddhas until just shortly before he died. He he was asking, am, am, am I an Arhant? You know, am I... An overcomer and a, a, a David Hall appeared and said, "No, you're not, because you don't even have the, you don't have the methods and the instruction for how to be one." So he said, "Well, is there anybody who can teach me?" He said, "Yeah, go over, over there, and you see, and the Buddha's over there, and he will help you, Shakyamuni." And so he goes and he says, "I'm looking for him," and and uh, Shakyamuni says, "Don't bother me, because it's it's you know it's we're uh, on arms rounds now. This is not the time." for this conversation. He says, who knows, I might die any time. You might too. He says, so can you teach me now? And three times the Buddha says, no, this is not the time. And finally, seeing that his determination was strong and also knowing that his time was close, the Buddha gave him something and he just gave him something so simple. So we think we need 10,000 books and we think we need a, a lifetime to attain. We just need to hear it and have a, a singleness of purpose and focus, and it is within our grasp. And so that's, uh, I think I added to the story, but I always do. Um, uh, so that's how I, I came to this and uh, and still with this, um, trying to get out of that the buddha said when you get this right you won't be with it and if you're not with it you won't be in it and all wrapped up in in that you know so that's what i am still uh pressing towards the mark of the prize of that uh high opportunity in the dharma for awakening in this very life all right venerable thank you so much that's fascinating all the the trips and the different teachers that you've had uh, i'm curious i've listened to some commentary listen to you um, talking and teaching about the uh, Anapana Sati Sutta, the mindfulness of breathing. Was that maybe one of the main suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya that uh, you found most impactful? Or, or were there other suttas or just even shorter things from, from that collection? Well, I think that was the main the main one, I, I love it because the breath is always with you as a, as an object, but it's not just an object. It's a it's a it's a gateway, you know, um, and and I like it because it's so simple, you know. And you can always do it. There 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 are many other practices that I do. Uh, actually, I've come to understand meditation in a little different way uh, uh, from a perspective from a um, a uh, Vajrayana perspective. Uh, meaning that we do the preliminary practices of getting the mind in a, in a place that is conducive uh, to uh, 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 encountering wisdom. Uh, and then we um, think or incline the mind in the way that uh, the Buddha says a Buddha's mind is, 
you know, and we uh, imagine or hold what if my mind was inclined in that way, you know, what that would be like for me. And we spend time sitting and resting in that. And then we offer our gratitude for, for having that time to, uh, to do that. You know, and the more you do that, he said, whatever you think and ponder on becomes the inclination of your mind. So if I'm thinking, like, how would Buddha think about this? What would Buddha say about that? What action would he take towards this? Then I'm going to be inclining my mind more and more towards that. And I think I'll come closer to it than just having a discussion about it. You know, so just taking that time out. But uh, but one has to to be able to do that successfully, one has to have a certain degree of concentration. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the Anapanasati comes in, I feel, for me and the students that I, I teach. Um, and I maybe do it a little bit differently, you know, and uh, I guess that's okay. You use whatever technique that works, you know. Uh, somebody asks, what's the highest or the best Dharma? And, um, you know, the answer to that is the one that you will practice. You know, the one that you will do. Um, or what's the best meditation? Uh, likewise, it's the one that you will actually do. And so uh, with the Anapanasati, you know, he gave us an example. He said, like a gatekeeper, he doesn't care where the person comes from or where they go after they enter the city. He's only watching right there when they step from outside the gate to inside. You know, he said, let your, let your meditation, your focus be like that. You know, so I'm holding or I'm uh, steady just experiencing that breath as it crosses that one threshold from outside to inside until there's no difference in outside or inside. And somewhere in that process, the mind doesn't uh, latch it down on that or this, on outside or inside or in between. And um, uh, and then you... Uh, somewhere, but no particular where. And you start to experience and know, know, you start to know the vastness of the mind and a level of consciousness that's more than the ordinary uh, consciousness. That's, and these things, and it's hard to talk about them. And he said, you really shouldn't even talk about them too much. <laughs> you should do the work so that you can experience them, and, and then you'll know for yourself, and there will be no doubt. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable Panyavati. That was the most, the first time I've heard the Bahia Sutta's uh, phrasing of you being neither here nor there, nor, any, nor anywhere in between applied to mindfulness of breathing. And that was just gorgeous. Um, one really interesting point, you know, you talk about how some people have to be lifted up and others have to be tamped down. I get the sense I'm someone who has to be tamped down a little bit. I don't know where you fall, Ajahn. Lift it up. <laughs> but, uh, Me too. <laughs> you know, and and one interesting thing is the, uh, you, you know, you've been pointing this dynamic in a few ways, uh, how the Majjhima Nikaya and these sort of poly teachings were that grounding tool, um, whereas maybe, you know, some of these broader conceptions of God or bodhicitta were somewhat nebulous or, or ungrounded. Um, and then now also speaking about how your practice of mindfulness of breathing was a grounding element, like a crispness to that. Um, so, yeah, I wondered if you would speak more about both sides of that equation, um, the grounding and the transcendence. So are there any other aspects of the Pali teachings and the canon that you find really you keep coming back to as ground, grounding elements like the Vinaya. And have you found that that, you know, when you talked about the experience of mindfulness of breathing, you pointed to this moving through that single point of the breath into a broader mind. And so I'm curious also, like, has this grounding allowed you to move even deeper into that, that transcendent part about God or enlightenment or whatever you would want to call or, or the Dhamma. So it's a broad yeah. question. Yeah, one of my favorite suttas is uh, 128. And this is a sutta where, um, you know, there was some quarreling and disputing at one of the um, uh, sites where some of the Buddhist disciples had, had gathered and they were 
in residence. And he said, brethren, you shouldn't argue. And they said, we got this. And three times he encouraged them not to argue. And finally, and they three times they told him, you are a guest here, basically, you know. And and then he said uh, something about hatred never ceases by hatred, but only by non-hatred. He didn't give a, a opposing view. He didn't say, but by love, by compassion. He said, hatred, non-hatred. So you have to look at what constitutes hatred, and from that you can figure out what's the opposite of that. That's what you should do. And so, but he got gathered his robe and his bowl, and he went on down the road, road and he ran into uh, Anna Ruta and a couple of the other monks. And he decided to stay with them for a little while. And he said, how are you all getting along? He says, oh, we're getting along great. And he says, in what way? He says, oh, we're blending like milk and water. You know, milk and water can blend. Milk and oil separate. So he says, we're blending like milk and water. He said, well, how do you do that, Anna Ruta? He said, well, you know, I think, first of all, what a, what, how wonderful it is. What a great boon it is to be with my brethren in the holy life. So why should I do what I want to do? Why not do what they want to do? He said, and then I not only think it, I do it. I do what they want to do. And then, and Buddha says, oh, that's really great. And then he asks him another question about how they handle their day-to-day -day affairs. He says, well, you know, one, some go out to get alms rounds. You know, another sets out the, the table for the food. You know, another, even if, if he comes back and we ate all the food, he doesn't get mad and say, you ate all the food. He just cleans up. You know, maybe go to bed hungry that night because he got back too late. I don't know. But, you know, he was showing how, how what it is to truly blend like milk and water and, and, and to re truly rejoice in having good friends in the Dhamma. And so he said, oh, this is excellent. This is excellent, Anna Ruby. And he said, and how's your meditation going? And he said, meditation's going great. And he said, um, he said, well, have you had, you know, any kind of, of supernormal, uh, have you seen a light and vision of form since you've been meditating? He said, oh, yeah, we see the lights and the visions of forms. And he says, and what happens then? He says, well, they disappear. And uh, I said, Buddha said, why is that, Anna Ruth? He said, well, we haven't figured out the reason for that. And Buddha said, you should, you should know the reason for that. He said, while I was just an unenlightened bodhisattva. So there it is right there in the Pali canon about bodhisattvas. And you know, while I was just an unenlightened bodhisattva, I too saw the light and vision of forms. You know, he said, and they would disappear. But I thought, why did they disappear? And as I reflected, I realized, and he started talking about like 20 different things, you know, excess of energy arose in me. Deficiency of energy arose in me. You know, pride arose in me. Fear arose in me. Doubt arose in me. He named all, but each time that one thing arose and he discovered what was the reason that time, he said, I shall um, meditate in a way, practice in a way that that does not arise in me again. And so one by one, he clipped them off. You know, until he was left uh, stainless. And so it's so wonderful, you know. Uh, but I think we just meditate and everybody says, oh, you know, you can have a good meditation. You have a bad meditation. Don't worry about it. No, he said reflect and figure out what happened right there, you know, and uh, and what what happened in the meditation and why it didn't take you to the goal of the practice. And then he said, uh, work it at, uh, at correcting that, you know. And so, but you look and see something there that I see a tie-in, and that's the way we live in our community, because I know you all are establishing community. That's the way we live in our, our sangha, our, our, uh, our lay, laity and our monastics. It's very egalitarian uh, uh, community, you know, um, and our nuns and our monks, you know, very egalitarian community. And so we prize all, all of them, the four, the fourfold sangha in that sense, male and female lay, male and female monastic, you know, as the sons and daughters of, of the Buddha. And we hold them all in uh, equally high esteem. And... Um, and we uh, blend like milk and water, respecting each other's vows and helping each other keep the vows they made. You know, you take a vow, 
you make a vow, you make a vow unto yourself. You don't make it to me. It might benefit me if you keep it because <laughs> you're being a good and respectful person. But you make that vow to yourself. So if you break that vow, you've broken a vow that you made to yourself. You know, and so we help encourage each other to keep the vows you make. So some take eight vows, some take ten, some take five, some take, you know, the whole the whole ball of wax. I mean, and um, and in this way, we encourage each one to walk on their path to the extent that they can, to the degree that they that they want to, and we we respect that. Mm-hmm.